All right, gonna do a video quickly on the origin of this right here, Sudoku. Am I saying that right? Sudoku, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, wife was a real big fan of this thing because she likes brain teaser types of things, crossword puzzles and word finds, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, whatever, just between doing things, meals and whatever else, and work and things, she just sits down and does one of these occasionally. But I, I don't know why it was, but it was like every time she'd be doing one of these, I'd, I'd get like this irritated feeling and just like kind of mad about it. And the other other day, the Lord put it in my mind, why don't you look at the origin of this thing, the Sudoku thing? And I thought, yeah, okay, you know. To me, it just was like, well, you know, it's not my thing. But uh, I'm kind of shocked to see what the origin of the Sudoku thing is. I'm going to show you this and how Satan is so subtle he can get things into your home without you even realizing it. So here we have the article that I found. Um, it says here, Sudoku has its deep roots in ancient number puzzles. Then it gets into magic squares. Check this out. Magic square puzzles which involve the ordering of consecutive numbers into a square comes to us from the myths of history. The magic square is first documented in China 2,000 years ago. The puzzle is both numerical and positional and positional problem as all the rows, columns, and diagonal lines through the grid must, grid must add up to the same number. Okay? I remember learning something about that in one of my math classes in, in my uh, junior high or high school years. It was hmm. something similar to that, where you had to, the lines, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, had to uh, add up to a certain number. I forget what the math class was called or the subject hmm. was called. No idea. But then check this out. Solutions were considered to have mystical properties and became part of the Chinese I Ching Book of Changes method of telling the future. Um, that's called divination in our King James Bible. Um, so this thing is actually goes back what looks like a seemingly innocent little, oh, it's just innocent, just fun, whatever, little brain teaser. No, it's actually divination. And I know somebody's going to say, well, I don't use it for divination. I don't use it. But you see, the Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil, right? And very interesting. We'll show you a bunch of more connections here. This is the guy that supposedly uh, came up with this thing. Basically, he didn't really come up with it. He just popularized it, started bringing in the thing of, uh, you know, these number puzzles, these magic puzzles, and, and making them popular. Interesting connections with this guy. And... Uh, but uh, his name's Leonard Euler. Here you can see it. And he's also tied to Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz. Or Leibniz, whatever, how you pronounce his name. Um, some interesting things here. We'll show you where he was educated at and some of his other connections. Um, just, you know, again, what's the mindset of why would you take a magical puzzle and make it, bring it into the mainstream? That's important to understand that. Uh, French interlude, where is that at? Um, brief and localized. Yep. A brief and localized version of Magic Squares appeared as a newspaper puzzle between 1890 and 1920 in France. That's very interesting because I remember uh, growing up, the Lancaster New Era, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up at, um, they, uh, they would have Sudoku puzzles right beside the horoscope. And I used to always think that's, you know, horoscope I know is bad, but, you know, Sudoku, I just didn't really think much of it. It's actually divination. So is that it for this article? One more section, Sudoku characters, if you know. Yeah, it says here, if you know the Japanese language, you may know that the Sudoku characters are actually ones that originated from Chinese. So again, it's not you know, that uh, this thing is just a Japanese, whatever, uh, came from China. And there's a lot of mysticism within the Chinese and, and a lot of the Orient and things over there. So I thought that was interesting. But here's a PDF file on this Leonard guy that came up with the the founder of the Sudoku puzzle that they traced back, traced back to. Um, it says here, in, in October of 1720 at the age of 13, not unusual at the time, Leonard enrolled in the, at the University of Basel, first at the philosophical faculty where he took the freshman courses on elementary mathematics given by Johann Bernoulli, younger brother of the now deceased Jacob. 
Mm-hmm. And then down to in 1723, Euler graduated with a master's degree in a public lecture in Latin comparing Descartes' system of natural philosophy with that of Newton, mm-hmm. Isaac Newton. So, philosophy. Hmm. The guy that came up with the Sudoku thing, popularized it, uh, was into philosophy. What does the Bible, the King James Bible, say about philosophy again? Yeah, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Hmm. Interesting. But let's look at the University of Basel here. This is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, Here we have the picture from their website. Um, History. Inaugural ceremony at the Basler Minster. Bishop Johann von Wenningen names Georg von Anlau kneeling on the front. First rector on April 4th, April 1460. And hands Mayor Hans von London. There you go. <laughs> the deed of foundation. Sorry, my tongue's a little tied right now. Um, the university opened. The university opened with a mass held at Basel Minster on 4th of April 1460. You can look up the Basel Minster thing. It's a huge, big cathedral. Supposedly a former Episcopalian church building. Yeah. So they say. Mm-hmm. Um, go down to the four faculties, become seven. Um, from the very beginning sentence. Yep. Let's read this paragraph here. It says, From the very beginning, the basic organizational structure was comprised of four faculties, theology, law, medicine, along with the faculty of arts, which later became the faculty of philosophy. Hmm. The faculty of Ar- arts sought to provide a solid basis of knowledge and prepare students in, for studies in theology, law, and medicine. Very Otherwise known as spiritual formation, theological formation, formation of priests, those are all words used interchangeably in the Roman Catholic Vatican Jesuit structure. That's what they use to, uh, in various forms, to either say, we're going to open up a openly Jesuit institution, an openly Catholic university or college, or a quote-unquote independent college or university. But it's Mm -hmm. still the same basic tenets, whether you go to an openly Catholic or Jesuit or not institution and uh, the next section periods of prosperity and of stagnation that starts with the reformation years okay Um, says here the reformation years were a true test for an institution so strongly shaped by religion Hmm. Uh, no it's called Catholicism yeah very much so and uh, scroll down to the chronology find it interesting too for the catholics out there you know oh this is you're attacking the catholics and stuff just see the symbol just, just hold on a second there um you know why are catholic educated men coming out and studying you know first of all studying philosophy and then getting into bringing magic ancient chinese magic and making it mainstream divination and stuff dabbling in all this stuff we'll get more into that here as we continue but interesting picture there Mm-hmm. You know, yep. kind of tell who's in charge, you know what I mean? Um, what is, in, 1460, uh, the University of Basel celebrates its founding at Basel Minster. And then 1527, the doctor, alchemist, and philosopher Paracelsus teaches as a professor of medicine. Hmm. The yeah. medical establishment is tied in with this thing. But, it, see, this doesn't make any sense. Because how could you have a doctor... Somebody into alchemy, which later became, is the pharmaceutical industry, basically. Mm-hmm. And a philosopher? Those are all just, you know, they don't line up, do they? No, never. They wouldn't do such a thing. That wouldn't be Catholic. I mean, uh, uh, that would Scientific. Would... Yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Sp- if you think the modern medical establishment is part of real science, uh, you're deceived. Yeah. It's not. This is um, another reason why you don't trust the academic institutions. You don't trust your quote unquote medical doctor. Yeah. Un- understanding here, please, because I know some people are going to be like, are you paid two or nuts? Well, we are, but you know, in this area, just listen for a minute. Alchemy is basically these guys, these alchemists and things, were always trying to find a way to turn uh, different chemicals and make it into gold and things. It's, it's, it's uh, chemistry combined with occultism is what alchemy is. I mean, look it up. Look it up. And these philosophers and things like that, again, are 
basically Luciferians. You know, they they they'll you know get into all this other stuff to try and explain away the Bible and things. Yep. So 15. interesting. But what are we doing now? Now in 1590, expansion of the university library with the addition of 2,700 books from the former cloister libraries. I emphasize the word cloister because it is indicative of the Roman Catholic monastic order, whether it be a monastery or a uh, convent of monks and nuns. Cloister mm -hmm. means enclosed. Sometimes it can be an open cloister, other times it is usually closed. And ironically, there are dorm halls on college and university campuses that are almost completely uh, closed in and could be termed as cloisters if you really want to get to the bottom of where mm -hmm. that architectural design comes from. So there's even subtle monastic tentacles of Catholicism in your quote-unquote independent college and university campuses. Yeah. They just it's, call it different terms. But let's continue. And, 1822? Yeah, yep. What do we got there? The university begins publishing its course directory in German instead of Latin. Only the Roman Catholic Church utilizes Latin and loves to do so because most people don't read and understand the language. And hence the Catholic hierarchy in the Vatican and of course the Jesuits uh, alongside them, they uh, they speak in eloquent mannerisms and fair words and speeches, and it sounds all high and mighty because they speak in Latin. But mm. Latin is really uh, the true. How would you describe Latin? Well, it's just Latin is a is a language. I mean, fine, whatever. But it's just. It was used by the Catholic Church for over a thousand years to keep people in subjection. Yes. Keep people dumbed down. And, you know, there are still Catholics that are very vehement in their desire for the Mass to be said only in Latin. And, uh, you know, that that's the official holy language of the Catholic Church. So, um, Latin is an African language, too, by the way. So, uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. Alexandria, Egypt, Egyptian, you know, things are... I mean, when you had Jesus die on the cross, there were three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, representing the three kindreds, yep. basically, the three descendants of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Another study. But yep. what are we going to next here? Then we go to the next article on Leibniz. Uh, the very first sentence, starting with over a period of about. Okay. And only that sentence for now. All right. Over a period of about half a century, Leibniz pro professed in letters and writings his strong and continued interest in China. So this is another one of the guys that worked with, what was the guy's name? Uh, the, uh, Euler. Euler. Okay, Euler. Yeah. So he you was very could, much interested in China. You could even potentially say that this was one of the mentors of Euler, as we'll see later on why I say that as a possible theory. Okay. Uh, go down to the sentence starting with um, it became uh, yep okay. it became persistently it became persistently extended um, and more profound as it you just read it I'll just highlight okay it became persistently extended and more profound as a result of the conversations carried on in Rome in 1689 with the Jesuit father Grimaldi from these discussions emerged Hmm. Leibniz's vision of a hitherto un unknown cultural and scientific exchange with China. A mutual exchange yep. of knowledge in all areas in both theory and practice. Ironic because that's what academia does today. They have a lot of theories about how to do things, but practical mm -hmm. function of how to do, say, operating a farm. Academia says, we have a lot of theories, and they sound so plausible, but when you actually work on a farm and start a farm in practice, in practical functioning, it's a whole lot different. You throw out all the stupid academic theories, and you see very quickly what works and what doesn't. Yep. And, um, and then this vision of China, right here, that sentence, Revealed in the foreword to the Novissima Seneca is for Leibniz and Europe attri attributable to the Jesuit missionaries in China 
who at the time provided the most reliable accounts of China in letters, reports, and books. Hmm. And one more sentence. In this very period, Where? very first sentence of that paragraph. Whoa. <laughs> Come on, stop being so stubborn. In this very period stands Leibniz's direct correspondence with the fathers of the French Jesuit mission, who, as royal mathematicians and members of the Academy Francaise, had also been sent in 1685 by Louis the Fourteenth on a scientific mission to China. China's origins and relationship with the Jesuits traces back far beyond than most people think of the recent happenings of today. Uh, China now creating everything in the world, you know, almost every made single... In China. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, or made in Taiwan or Hong Kong. A lot it's of all this, China. Yeah, a lot of the stuff I haven't even seen yet. She just, you know, did the research. Um, so... So, yeah. This, interesting. So you basically have a, a Jesuit... Um, instructing this Leibniz guy and you know basically I, I can't say telling him to, to study this stuff and whatever else but I mean it's the Jesuits their missionaries Mentor. getting into these countries and things and uh, again that's that's what people don't quite understand I mean 15 what was it 1540 or so 1540 was the founding yeah. of the Jesuit order yeah and since 1540 these people have been going around the world and infiltrating literally every country on the map. They get kicked out of countries. Do the historical research. The Jesuits have been kicked out of countries. Why is that? Because they watch my videos, I guess, on YouTube, apparently, according to some, you know, they're followers of me or something. No, because the Jesuits are a very satanic order. And they get in there and they these guys are experts at philosophy, they're experts at mathematics, they're, they look for the intellectuals, okay, the ones that, that really, you know, follow the Luciferian um, formula of Genesis chapter 3 of, you know, yea hath God said. Uh, yeah. That's what these guys do. And they, they will get in, they will get into politics, they will get into medicine, they will get into whatever they can to bring people into bondage, to bring people into subjection. Spiritual bondage. You bring spiritism type of stuff into your home and you leave it there, we're going to be burning these. Uh, after this video is done just wanted to use them as props but um, if they can bring spiritual things in your home you know they're going to they're going to diminish your effectiveness as a Christian so just oh wicked but anyways is there anything else in this one no not of that this article one? okay uh, this is the AMORC website of the Rosicrucian Order uh, ancient what is it Ancient uh, mystical order, order of, of the, the Rosy, Rosy Cross, Cross. Okay. or Rosicori, depending on yeah. the language. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, this is a podcast page from the Rosicrucian Order's own website. Sir Isaac Newton, mystic and alchemist, staff of the Rosicrucian Research Library. Uh, many people are familiar with, with Sir Isaac Newton 1642 to 1727 one of the most extraordinary scientists and mathematicians in the history of humanity in this article the staff of the Rosicrucian Research Library introduces us to Sir Isaac Newton passionate mystic and the world's most famous alchemist I just have to tell a little blurb of a story here about Newton back right after I got saved uh, I made the stupid mistake of you know thinking online dating site through a, a website called uh, christianmingle.com was the name of it and uh, you know I had posted a profile on there you know thinking oh you know well you know you can imagine that I'll, I'll I thought at the time oh I'll be able to find a husband through this website or something well obviously the Lord didn't want that to work out and I thank him for that but the point of, of this story is somebody had sent me a, a message and they said they mentioned the word Isaac Newton was a Christian I forget what the whole message said before that but they tried to portray Sir Isaac Newton as a Christian as an actual Bible believing Christian per se and when I read that I thought to myself let me look this up 
was he really a Christian? And I did a little bit of research. I didn't find this at the time. The Lord showed me this recently. Uh, but at the time, I got a funny feeling about Isaac Newton being heralded as a great Christian man and scientist. And uh, so I disregarded the rest of the message because I thought to myself, if this you know, professing Christian guy on this website is saying that Isaac Newton was a Christian, and thus far my research doesn't tell me that that that's the case. Um, and knowing my background, I really felt odd about Newton being called a Christian. I said, well, I'm not even going to try and, and take heed to anything else this guy is saying. I think it was something to do with uh, me saying I was a Ron Paul uh, captain, neighborhood captain, I forget what the thing was called, mm -hmm. for the for the politics thing, which I was actually, um, that whole thing started only because uh, a local businessman from my hometown hypnotized me into the political scene, but that's another thing. And so uh, I pretty much thought, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to be very, very careful about who I listen to for advice or what they say, because if they're calling Newton a uh, quote unquote Christian and he doesn't sound like it, then what else are they going to try and, you know, lead me astray on? So, um, right after the Lord saved me, I got a funny feeling about, uh, Newton supposedly being a Christian. And, and obviously he's not because the Rosicrucian Order's own website states he was a Rosicrucian and alchemist. Yeah. Both occult things. Yes. And... But... The next tab also goes into more detail. And scroll down to crossing the Atlantic section. And, you know, some of this stuff I don't recommend reading. Okay, I'm no. not going to be putting links to any of this stuff. What is it? But this is very key. The, crossing the Atlantic? history, yes. Throughout okay. history. Throughout, oops. Well, throughout history, and no, that's not the one. That one. Throughout history, a number of prominent persons oh, okay. in the fields of science and the arts have been associated with the Rosicrucian movement, such as Da Vinci, Cornelius Heinrich, Agrippa, Paracelsus, Francois Rebellius, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Francis Bacon, Robert Flood, Jacob, Bam, and... Yeah, you can read the whole list. It doesn't matter. Pascal, like Pascal's Triangle that you're taught in your mathematics classes in public schooling and college and university stuff. Uh, Baruch Spinoza, I think that guy was a Jesuit if I'm not mistaken. Isaac Newton. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and the rest of the bunch there. But yeah, check that out. Newton and Leibniz are both Rosicrucians from the Rosicrucians' own website. And I thought this was rather telling. Yep. And they had a hand in bringing this Sudoku thing yes. to be. So that's why we're even talking about this. Yes. But uh, next one? Yes. Okay. And this is rather telling. This is, again, the guy, Leonard Euler from the article, the main right. guy. Supposedly created the Sudoku puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, in 1740, the sentence, Leonard Euler's accomplishments were growing and his reputation increasing. Uh, especially in France, where his mechanics of the science of motion set forth analytically received a highly favorable review in the influential Parisian Jesuit journal. Uh, Whatever. Um, right, I don't speak French. And he won his third consecutive annual Prix de Paris. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, he won this Prix de Paris prize, along with three others, uh, including a Jesuit mathematician. Antoine Cavallari. Hmm. Have to wonder if the other three were also the other two that Bernoulli and Colin McLaren have some Jesuit ties. I, d I didn't look that up, but you have to wonder. <laughs> and uh, so that's from the Leonard Euler Mathematical Genius in the Enlightenment book, as you can see. And uh, the next book, uh, The Early Mathematics of Leonard Euler. Uh, in 1740, he was asked to cast a horoscope for the young Prince Prince Ivan. Hmm. Interesting. Sudoku mm -hmm. tied in with horoscopes. And uh, on down to Euler won a four, one fourth share of the Paris Prize on the ebb and flow of the tides, sharing the prize with Daniel Bernoulli, Colin McLaren, and Jesuit 
mathematician Antoine Cavallari. Interesting. Then, so that's another book that says that he uh, worked with Jesuit mathematicians and Jesuits in uh, bringing about his ideas and theories. This is a book called The Jesuit Contribution to Science, A History. And um, it talks about how Newton and Leibniz had a, had a hand in creating differential and integral, integral calculus, which was used by Leonard Euler in his work. And uh, Yep, and again you can see the, I'm not going to read all this, but you can see the Jesuit connections here and here. Yes. To Leonard Euler. Yes. And so. the last one, Puzzles Galore, this is rather telling. This is the back of a book called Puzzles Galore, Volume 1, Sudoku and Sudoku Like Puzzles. Uh, the Portuguese Jesuit missionaries right here brought the game to India, where it was enjoyed in the harem of the great Mughal. So, again, the Jesuit missionaries traveled around the world bringing this divination-based occultic uh, game under the guise of Sudoku in its modern-day term. The Jesuit missionaries loved to spread this game around because it sounds so innocent and I started playing brain teasers like Sudoku as a lost woman many years ago as a way to just kind of, if I was stuck on a, a problem, a math problem or something, I would play a brain teaser for a few minutes and then go back to my, my work and figure out, oh, okay, that's where I went wrong. Things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, never knowing, up until the Lord recently showed us a few days ago, never knowing just how occultic this game is. And it sounds so innocent. And trust me, I've gone through all the little reasonings of, oh, but it's fun. Um, I'm not keeping that satanic book in, in this house. I'm burning it. Mm -hmm. And I, yep. and I hope you will do the same thing if you have this innocently in your home. It's a doorway for the devil to use and to get in your home and cause spiritual bondage and divisions and problems in your, in your marriage and in your relationships. And it can Absolutely. be a hindrance to your prayer requests if you are willfully keeping this book on hand after hearing this video. Mm -hmm. Let me just explain something here. Because I know some people are probably going to be like, oh, brother, this is just, this is, you're blowing things out of proportion, the whole deal. Um, one of the things that the uh, Jesuits swear to, they swear total obedience to the Pope, to their to their black Pope, actually, the, the superior. Although, right now the Pope's a Jesuit as well, so it works out. But, um, and one of the things that they say that they will do is that they will poison um enemies of the church well poison when you think of poison you think of a chemical alchemy you know but uh no tie-ins there no never but here's the thing and here's what people need to understand the jesuits can also poison through other means and that is spiritual poison and it doesn't take much you know, that's why jesus christ talked about a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump and you see, the Jesuits are, are masters at this thing where they can get little drops of sin into your life that don't appear like it's that bad. It's not that bad. But they get those little drops, that little bit of leaven, and it just permeates throughout the house and it, and it messes things up. Um, this is something that you need, to, you need to get it away. Okay? You need to get away from this stuff. It's bad. So... Uh, just you know interesting video definitely some tie-ins there we needed to go over um, that are quite telling and again you know I need to say this and that is this whole university system um, the, a lot of the math and things like this wasn't he involved this uh, Euler guy wasn't he involved in the pi formula or whatever he was involved in a whole bunch of things yeah. that's a whole different story I'm not going to get into but... yeah he was again you know you're, you're put through public schooling and you're taught about some of this stuff, and I remember the Dewey Decimal System, the guy was like this, I forget it was a communist or something like this. I mean, it's ridiculous. So many of the great philosophers and great teachers and Charles Darwin, these people were all God-hating reprobates is what they were. And you're taught you just have to bow down and worship these people in public school, and it's just like, no, I don't think so. 
And that's why if you're a Christian, um, and, 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 you know, I know some people, even before you get saved, like I was a professing Christian all throughout high school, but I wasn't born again until, you know, I was 25 years old, another story. But, but even, even as somebody who, you know, you don't hate God and whatever else, you might not be saved, but you're, you're wanting to know about God. There are certain aspects of public schooling and university, especially where you're just like, something just doesn't sit right with me. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's just, something isn't right. I don't like being in this class. I don't like what I'm being taught. I, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're rejecting truth. You're, you're just like, something feels really wrong here. Well, it's a, a lot of it is because of these people that are coming up with our modern day systems of math and quote unquote science, it all comes back from, it all goes back to the occult and to divination and magical practices and things like this. I mean, it's, it's insanity <laughs> what, what it now is being passed off as medicine and science and, and learning and stuff like this. And that's why you go off to the university and you, the more of this type of stuff that you study, willingly you know philosophy and stuff like that it will ruin you i mean you know when the bible says beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy think about what's being said there you are spoiled you are rotten and after you go through all this philosophical training and you're ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth just like mm -hmm. the king james bible says why because you will never ever ever hear about this type of thing in your classes. You will never hear about the origin of calculus. You will never hear about who founded algebra. You will never hear about mm -hmm. any of this stuff. Yeah. And if you dare question any of it, they'll laugh at you. They'll mock you. And they'll, and they'll say, uh, you know, um, they'll threaten you because um, there was a situation when I was in Boston uh, as a lost woman, you know, because uh, I went through trauma-based mind control you know, before getting into the academia thing. And, um, you know, it was always crammed down my throat. You will go to college. You will get a degree. Almost in that demeanor. And, um, and one day I saw something, uh, I'm not quite sure the details anymore, but something made me very, very angry one day in one of my online classes. And, uh, I took a combination of campus based and online classes at the time in 2011. And one day I got really angry and I just wrote this message in the water cooler area of the online discussion forum through Blackboard. Now it's called something else. And uh, I said something effective, down with the banksters, you know, rebel against the banksters. And boy, you talk about lighting the fires with the instructor because he put a, uh, some kind of a, uh, a, a deal, an ordeal where he told the student that I was like trying to get people to wake up to the truth. That was my unique way at the time of getting people to wake up to the system of academia and who funds academia and the banking system and everything. Not knowing back then what the Lord has shown me now. And mm -hmm. uh, that caused quite a, st a turmoil and a stir in the class. And uh, the instructor sent me a threatening undertone based message to basically shut up. So what I'm saying is, is if you dare to ask certain questions that will uh, reinvent the wheel of the system, so to speak, or um, overthrow the, the order of the academic system already in place, they will either threaten you with grade, grade lowerings and grade decreases or they'll do something to you academically, or they might even, if it's severe enough, just kick you out of the system and railroad you out. And mm -hmm. uh, they have creative ways of threatening you. Not outright openly at times, but they will do it in a subtle, politically correct tone. Yeah, and you know, she's saying all this because we do get you know a lot of correspondence with people and they say, you know, my parents want me to go to the university, um, I'm in the university, and whatever else, um, do what you can to get out of that thing. Yes. Okay. Um, and and I just need to say this because a lot of people don't get this, and that is, when you are a Christian, and you, when you get saved, you're going to find that there's a whole lot of stuff that you've been deceived on, a whole lot of stuff that you are involved in, and you're going to go, 
wow, okay, how on earth am I going to clean all this stuff up? And you're going to see those that are saved that are like way down the road, like, you know, like they've been through that road of sanctification. Don't get frustrated, okay? It's a process, brethren. If you're in the university thing, okay, start to work on ways to get out of it. Yes. All right, if you can walk away from it, do that. If you can't, well, then try to pray about it ask the lord for direction ask the lord for leading all right this is something that you can do quickly all right this thing is from ancient chinese divination magic number puzzles all right the lord's not going to bless you if you keep this kind of junk around all right get rid of it burn it all right don't put it on ebay and try to get some money for it or whatever else no get rid of it all right burn it by fire that's the method that was done in the book of acts all right they brought arts and, and divination types of things together and they burn them so that's what you got to do and you know when you watch our videos please don't think that we're saying that you're just like you know we get this all the time people say oh you think you're everybody else is lost no we don't think that okay what we're saying is there are things that if it's wrong then you clean that thing up in your life all right get away from this stuff and the lord will lead you along he's leading us along i mean literally this is just a couple days ago. You know, this whole time we've been in ministry, you know, we she plays us just occasionally and things the whole time, and we had no idea. I mean, we're just totally ignorant of this thing, that this is ancient Chinese divination stuff. And and some, we're going like, oh, brother. And sometimes I would even play a, do a Sudoku puzzle before going to bed at night because it was my way of unwiring my brain. My I have a very, very active brain, and... Uh, Sometimes I don't. Oh, uh huh. Okay, thought printer. <laughs> you always steal my thoughts. Uh huh. You know, he acts all innocent. You know. I am. I am innocent. Uh huh. Everything that's wrong with us, it's her fault. Uh huh. So. Yeah. But no. But seriously, yeah. She would. She would use this type of thing to like when she's going to bed and stuff. And and I'd be. It just. I always had a weird feeling about this, and I didn't understand why. So and again, learned to. to you know, rely on the, the discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. If you start feeling kind of weird about something, do a little bit of research and see where did this whatever it is come from. So we've we've uh, ran it enough here. Um, just want to do this video just to as a little bit of a heads up to anybody out there. If you're messing around with this Sudoku stuff, get rid of it. Okay, um, it's Chinese divination essentially. I was ignorant until so, the Lord showed me. I yep. had no idea. Yeah. And if you're ignorant about it too, you know, please get rid of it by fire. And if you watch this in its entirety and you still want to comment and say things like, uh, I don't believe you. That's, that's a lie. That's stupid. I'm not going to believe this. If you're willfully holding on to this thing after seeing this entire video, uh, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Mm hmm. Yep. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.